Hi, I'm Abby, I have a lot of records, and this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back, or welcome, if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry, I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. So I've done a good few album anniversary episodes on Vinyl Monday. I find they're a great way to look back on these records' cultural significance, and I love weaving my personal relationships with them into that narrative. Well, this week's album is arguably the most personally significant record that will ever be featured on Vinyl Monday. Yes, just as much as Layla, if not more so. Because this was my very first favorite album. I didn't own this on vinyl before deciding to cover it on this series. This video was the perfect excuse to finally add it to my collection. This week's album is... Siamese Dream by Smashing Pumpkins. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what album I'll be covering next week, plus polls and other fun stuff. You can find that on my channel. A note before we go any farther, Yes, I do call them Smashing Pumpkins, the, even though they are technically THE Smashing Pumpkins with the the, very 60s of them. Uh, they shortened the name to just Smashing Pumpkins for this release for some reason, and seeing as that was the name I grew up with, uh, Smashing Pumpkins is all I've ever known them as. All right, let's take this plastic off. So my copy is a reissue. This is the only official repress of Siamese Dream on vinyl, and man was it a bitch to find. I guess everyone bought them up for the anniversary too. And if you're a Smashing Pumpkins fan, you know that you have to take a small loan out on your house to buy anything of theirs on vinyl, and this was no exception. I had to pay 50 fucking dollars for this. I don't know how, but this is Billy Corgan's fault. This is not the original album art. The orange and purple foil you see here was a redesign for the 2011 issue. The album art I grew up with was red and white. The cover photo was shot by Melody McDaniel in LA, and for a long time there was a rock and roll mystery surrounding the girls on the Siamese Dream cover. Who are they? Were they really twins? Were they really joined at the wrist? Uh, no, they were not twins. They're not even related. This is Allie Langer on the left and Lysandra Roberts on the right. They're all grown up now, and they actually made an appearance in a promo video for the Pumpkins in 2018. Using my art history chops that I better have seeing as I have a degree in it, I believe this shot was chosen for its resemblance to the cherubs in Raphael's Sistine Madonna, at least I've always thought so. For as long as I can remember, my grandma has had a light switch with the cherubs on it, so those images were just burned into my brain since birth. It'd be a fitting tie-in to cherub rock, especially that line, beware all those angels with their wings glued on. In the gatefold, the original CD booklet was designed by Billy Corgan and his wife at the time, Chris. As the story goes, they assembled the OG collage on their wedding night with their family photos. This is an edited version with some photos of the band spliced in. There's so much to look at in this gatefold and like three inserts, so B-Roll Abby will be showing you all of that. On Siamese Dream, we have the classic era lineup of Smashing Pumpkins. We have Billy Corgan providing vocals, guitar, Mellotron, electric sitar, and doing the string arrangements. James E. Ha credited with guitar, Darcy Retsky credited on bass, I say credited because we'll get into that, and Jimmy Chamberlain on drums. We have a couple special guests on this thing. David Ragsdale of Kansas plays violin on Disarm and Luna, and Mike Mills of R.E.M. plays piano on Soma. This thing was produced by Butch Vig with Billy Corgan, mixed by Alan Mulder and Billy Corgan. My Issue was remixed by Bob Ludwig. Roll transition. <laughs> Pumpkins 
put out their first record, Gish, in 1991. They were influenced by 60s greats like The Velvet Underground, Jimi Hendrix, Jeff Beck, early metal like Black Sabbath, and goth fixtures like The Cure. They established their niche as a grittier yet dreamier brand of psych rock. Three months later, a little record called Nevermind comes out. Yes, I'm covering this because I don't want the YouTube Terms of Service gods or the Nirvana baby himself to nerf me. Everything changes overnight, not just for this band, but for everyone surrounding them. This included the Pumpkins. They'd never been considered grunge before this, but now that Nirvana was big, they were suddenly being lumped into the same category. And if you remember the Suvlaki video, what happened with MBV's Loveless, how that kind of ruined the shoegaze genre for everybody, the same thing happens with Nevermind and grunge. Music critics start seeing all the other grunge groups as lesser than, you know, if you were really this good, then Nevermind's success would have happened to you too. Too. That kind of elitist bullshit. Then we have Butch Vig, who had produced both Gish and Nevermind. Here he is with a number one record under his belt, seemingly by accident. And he wants to do that again, but on purpose this time. All of the pumpkins are having a hard time with this very sudden induction into the mainstream, but mostly frontman Billy Corgan and drummer Jimmy Chamberlain. Billy can't handle all the pressure thrust upon him, and his mental health takes a nosedive. He starts going to therapy to deal with his suicidal ideation, but finds therapy doesn't instill much will to live for him. So he goes, hey, if life isn't worth living, then I might as well make whatever the hell kind of music I want. I'm gonna go out with a bang. He starts writing songs in tandem with the therapy and finds it very productive. Just how productive, we'll get there, but first, we have to talk about what's going on with Jimmy. Jimmy was in no shape to be a big-time rock star. You could argue he wasn't in the shape to be in Smashing Pumpkins at all right now. He is reaching the apex of his heroin addiction, and it's freaking everyone out pretty bad. To add insult to injury, guitarist James Eha and bassist Darcy Retsky have just broken up. So let me get this straight. A band down on their luck, recording their sophomore album in 1992 for a 1993 release, experiences a relationship breakup that threatens to pull the whole band apart? Fuck the Nichols joke. How in the name of God has this extremely specific scenario happened twice? Have you learned nothing? The first song written for Siamese Dream is Today. It reads like a suicide note. We're off to a great start. It seems Billy's primary muse for the Siamese Dream material was, well, Billy. His mental health struggles and his therapy, his ideas of death, and the afterlife, his youth marred by an abusive madman of a father, his natural affinity for music that his father instilled in him, his fascination with the celestial and heavenly and mantic arts. Billy also got inspiration from his brother Jesse. The song Space Boy was written for him, and inspiration also came from his on-again, off-again relationship turned marriage to Chris. The song Luna reads as sort of a wedding gift to her. Siamese Dream was recorded at Triclops Studio in Marietta, Georgia from December of 92 to March of 93. It is well and truly a sh show from start to finish. This studio in Georgia was picked not for its facilities, but for its location. Jimmy was in real bad shape at this time and needed to be cut off from all his connections. That being said, production was halted several times because he'd go on days-long benders anyway. Now come 93, you have the rise of digital production. There's no longer the need to do everything on 16 tracks. You can make your whole album with a computer. Being champions of the sounds of the 60s and 70s, the Pumpkins wanted everything done analog. Billy, in particular, had some pretty ambitious ideas for this thing. He was listening to Band of Gypsies a lot at this time and really wanted that big Hendrix sound, and Butch Vig wanted to execute that vision for him. Analog works great when you function efficiently as a group. When you don't, 
Billy's perfectionism, plus James and Darcy locking themselves in rooms to avoid each other, minus your drummer, that equals both your timeline and your budget. Toast. Burnt toast. Charred to a crisp. Butch and Billy are totally playing mad scientist with this thing. There was so much stuff on so many tracks that it could be a hassle to physically cut and paste things to move them around, see what works where. Butch had to draw maps of songs with arrows for which guitar track went where. The map for Soma was one of the biggest he ever made. It ran onto the other side of the paper. Meanwhile, while you have absolute madman Jimmy Chamberlain refusing to use a click track. Now, Billy first earned his reputation as being, there's no eloquent way of saying this, one of the biggest dickheads in rock and roll through the production of this album. He made a pretty radical decision without consulting any of his bandmates about it. So I said James and Darcy were credited players on this album, but that doesn't actually mean they played on it. In the years since Siamese Dream's release, it's come out that the theory Billy either dubbed over or just flat out did the majority of the backing guitar, the solos, and the bass tracks uh, that theory was totally true. I see both sides to this. On one hand, production had blown their budget long ago. They're running way behind schedule. They didn't have the time, let alone the money, to be re-recording and overdubbing any more than they already have. On the other hand... What the fuck? Who does that? The third and final Siamese dream mystery, the only one that hasn't been answered in the 30 years since its release, is where the sample at the end of Space Boy came from. There's this theory that it came from the talk show Geraldo, but come on, it's been 30 years, the rise of the internet has taken place since then. If it was from that show, somebody would have found the episode by now. We'll never know for sure where it came from because the pumpkins were only allowed to use this copyrighted audio on the condition that they never reveal its source. Damn it. It's the spring of 93 now, and things are running so far behind that Virgin Records steps in and essentially demands they hand over Siamese Dream. Not only do they say, put us back, we're not done, not only do they double down, they request Alan Mulder mix this record. The Pumpkins were paying attention to the music scene in the UK. They were, for the most part, entirely unconcerned with the whole grunge thing. They heard MBV's Loveless and wanted Alan to work that same magic for them. Also, they were all so emotionally exhausted from recording that they could not put an ounce more into Siamese Dreams. So the record gets handed off to Alan, he's given two weeks to mix it, and it takes 36 days. In the end, 13 songs made the cut for the record, making this a double album. This was a huge risk. Double albums weren't really the thing to do in 1993, but it was a risk Butch and the Pumpkins were willing to take. Remember when I said that Billy was in a productive period at this time? At least 30 songs were written for Siamese Dream. The Leftovers made it on B-sides of singles, the Pisces Iscariot compilation, or the deluxe edition of this record. But some really hard decisions had to be made regarding this track listing. Notable songs left on the cutting room floor include Pissant, a little interlude called French Movie Theme, USA, USA's counterpart USSR, and the title track. When all is said and done, the Pumpkins racked up a pretty hefty bill for Virgin Records. How bad was the damage? A quarter of a million dollars over budget. The Jesus, the track listing for Siamese Dream goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up disc one, we have Cherub Rock, followed by Quiet, then Today, and side one is rounded out with Hummer. Opening up side two, we have Rocket, followed by Disarm, 
and disc one is closed with Soma. Opening up disc two, we have Geek USA, followed by Mayonnaise, then Space Boy. Opening up side four, we have Silver... Oh, our swear is toast by now. I can just go. Opening up side four, we have Silver Fook. Silver Fook. <laughs> silver Fook. Followed by Sweet Sweet. And the album closes with Luna. Siamese Dream was released on July 27th, 1993, 30 years ago this week. This was the Pumpkins' major label debut. Gish had been released on some Virgin subsidiary and their mainstream aha moment. With a price tag like that, Virgin Records must have been thinking, oh, ho, 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 this bullshit better be a hit. And thankfully it was. It made the top 10 in the US and peaked at number four in the UK. Cherub Rock was issued as the promo single, followed by Smash Hit Today. This remains one of their greatest hits. Disarm and Rocket also got the single treatment through 94 to support the Pumpkins on tour. Ah, uh, there were a couple songs recorded during the Siamese Dream sessions that I conveniently forgot to mention, and that's because they are especially significant. There was one by the working title of Doorstep that is an early version of Melodory Magpie. The other song was called Infinite Sadness. I think we all know what happened to that one. In the 30 years since its release, Siamese Dream has enjoyed enduring success. In 2018, most of the classic era lineup got back together and the brunt force of their set list was material from this record. Kim Normal covered Siamese Dream in its entirety for its 25th anniversary. You can find that here on YouTube. I'll have it linked in this description. And in 2021, Fruit Bats released their cover album of Siamese Dream. So I said in the beginning of this video that this was my very first favorite album. I have a lot of history with it, so let's get right into my thoughts on this thing. My dress is too big to go in through the other side. <laughs> it's really hard to have independent thoughts about Siamese Dream. Thoughts that don't all mush into each other. Siamese Dream is the album I have the longest and most consistent history with. I cannot think of a significant chapter of my life without Siamese Dream in it. When I was 11, I raided my dad's CD cabinet and I stole a bunch of his albums. I don't know why I did it, I just did it. I was so transfixed by this album. It had this celestial atmosphere, that which the Pumpkins arguably perfected on Melancholy, but Siamese Dream is heaven with an undercurrent of darkness. Take the thesis statement of the whole album on Cherub Rock, Beware all those angels with their wings glued on. This album interlocked perfectly with my pre-existing curiosity of what else is out there. What's in the sky? What's written in the stars? What is death? Where do we go after we die? For the longest time, I could not understand a word of what Billy was saying. For 13 years, I loved Siamese Dream and did not have a clue what a good chunk of the lyrics were. Seriously, it took me an embarrassingly long time to realize it was disarm you with a smile. But what I did understand deeply resonated with me. From that much, you can probably guess the kind of things that were going on with me. Happy children do not contemplate mortality. Suddenly, at 24, I started to hear the words and get them. Siamese dream is like this secret language that I always understood, but I couldn't speak it until it decided it was time. Since this is a double album, I can't do the track by track breakdown that's become a norm on this series or else we'd be here for 50 fucking minutes. 
Instead, I'll be using specific moments from these tracks to illustrate the points that I'm making. Uh, there will be two exceptions, though. By nature of the whole Billy essentially recording the whole thing by himself thing, I can't praise individual musicians' performances like I would normally do. There's no way of knowing exactly how much James or Darcy contributed. It's tough not to wonder what a true Smashing Pumpkins Siamese dream would have sounded like. One of my favorite parts about Vinyl Monday is shouting out the player that might not get as much attention, and here I just can't. I wish I knew who to credit for that spectacular groan of the bass on Hummer, Geek USA, and Silver F***. The bass line has always been my favorite part about Hummer. The one exception in my crediting debacle, Jimmy Chamberlain. Of fucking course he was a jazz drummer. Of course his fills are all jazz. He may have been a disaster at this point in his life, but man could he play from the snare rolls at the very beginning of Cherub Rock to the last cymbal wash of Luna. This record is his full range on display. Geek USA is his strongest performance. I listen to that song, I sit there and I go, how is he even human? And that's not counting the bonus tracks, Pissin' and the title track just about blew me off my feet the first time I heard them. Just, Jimmy is the greatest rock drummer alive right now. All the other greats are dead. Speaking of tracks that got cut, I know some of these tracks were tough losses for Billy, especially Hello Kitty Cat. He fought really hard for that one. Um, but I believe this track listing and this sequencing is perfect. The tracks that were cut were cut because they sound too much like other, better songs on here. That being said, I prefer the B-side to the A-side. One really special thing about Siamese Dream is its intricate, incredible sound. Uh, this record is so textured. The dynamics on songs like Quiet, the way that guitar solo just careens in. The spectacular crunch of these guitars, especially on the A-side with Quiet and Hummer. The presence of guitars on this record, uh, they come from the sheer amount of them, not so much from the volume. Except for the spectacular crash of Rocket and Silver F**k's descent into hell, that is all volume. There were these sounds that were so fascinating growing up. What is this? on Hummer. And where did that sample from Space Boy come from? There are decidedly 60s touches on this thing, the magical Mellotron on Space Boy, and strings on Disarm and Luna to mirror it. Billy called himself cheesy for the sappier moments on this thing, I just call him nostalgic. It was all a very intentional process, both writing and producing. See the late motif, or Maybe it's just Billy's comfort thing between today and Geek USA. And hey, remember that throwaway slow dive joke from earlier? This morning, in the 11th hour, I found out that Billy was listening to the Jesus and Mary chain Psycho Candy and MBV's Isn't Anything a lot during this time. Two records that Neil Halstead of Slow Dive has specifically cited as being influences on Just For A Day and... Suvlaki. You have to see how crazy of a coincidence that it is that Neil and Billy, separated by a fucking ocean, mind you, were both spinning these records during 91 and 92. Suvlaki and Siamese Dream both came in the summer of 93 and both have this huge, immersive sound. Neil is more well-known as a master of atmosphere, especially in his more recent production exploits, but Billy should be seen as such too. Something else that's really special about Siamese Dream is Billy's deeply personal, introspective, yet surreal writing style. Of course, the line that comes up for most people is from today, I wanted more than life could ever grant me, that's Billy at his most dejected. But there's so much more than that. 
He taps into the surreal, angels with their wings glued on, connecting Siamese twins at the wrist in a dream. And he goes totally psychedelic on Cherub Rock, the opening line of the record, freak out, give in, to ask yourself a question, anyone but me, I ain't free, do you feel love is real from Hummer? There's this pervasive theme of the other, not so much being on the outside looking in, but uh, being in a birdcage or fishbowl and having everyone look in at you. I cannot articulate how much this theme has always resonated with me. We have the song Mayonnaise. Billy says this is the most personal of anything he's ever written. The lyric that got me most when this album was new to me, can anybody hear me? I just want to be me. But as I've heard more lyrics, things like shut my mouth and strike the demons, curse you and your reasons, out of hand and out of season, out of love and out of feeling come to mind. Fool enough to almost be it, cool enough to not quite see it, dull enough to always feel this, always old, I'll always feel this. How I feel about Billy Corgan's writing is how a lot of women feel about Taylor Swift's, because Jesus Christ, it's like he's writing from every diary I've ever kept, especially the stuff I was too scared to write down. Sure enough, Billy Corgan, Gemini Moon. Closing out disc one, we have Soma. At age 11 to 13, I had an iPod. It was from the lost and found at my mom's work because we were too broke to be buying iPods new. And I would listen to my iPod with Siamese Dream on it, outside, on my swing set, at all hours of the day. I'd be out there from after dinner until my mom had to come get me because it was dark and the coyotes and shit were gonna come out. Uh, for a long time, I thought that the crickets on Soma were just the sounds of crickets in my yard. Lo and behold, the crickets are on the record too. That was a really special discovery for me. Lyrically, this song feels like today, but a lot more angry. A defiant, self-imposed isolation. Let the sadness come again, on that you can depend on me, until the bitter, bitter end of the world when God sleeps in bliss. The build from the hazy, dreamy, spacey bridge to the back half of the song just crashing into you. It's a soaring guitar solo that I won't easily forget. This record is loaded with similar moments, but none quite like this. Uh, in a league of expansive, it's the most expansive. In a league of euphoric, it's most euphoric. I genuinely believe Soma is a perfect song. Of course, this record isn't perfect. You're definitely rocking with the 90s soft, loud, soft, loud cliche, but I can forgive this because no record of the 90s was free of this. But I have issues with this remix. Overall, it's fairly true to how I remember Siamese Dream sounding, except for the samples. I think the one at the end of Hummer is shortened and it's entirely washed out on Space Boy. You can hardly hear it. Before I get to talking about the long one, in the aeroplane video, I talked about the occasional sequencing drawback that comes from putting an album in the CD age onto vinyl. Believe it or not, there are occasional drawbacks to this format. On aeroplane, side one ends with Communist Daughter. This breaks the run into that album's long one, O oh, Comely. This is how Space Boy into Silverfuck is supposed to sound. I got feeling very alienated and unsatisfied and it's really come between us. <laughs> Siamese Dream on Vinyl breaks up what is, in my opinion, one of the most quintessentially Siamese Dream moments on Siamese Dream. It's that shock to the senses that you can't unhear or unfeel. Here, side three ends with Space Boy, and side four begins with Silver Fuck. I talked about Silver Fuck on the Losing My Opinion podcast, like, 
four months ago now? Christ, what a four months that has been! And this song was the pumpkin set closer for a long time. They'd just go crazy with this thing. The longest silver f on record was 45 minutes long. This is composed compared to how they'd usually do it. This was the song that convinced me Smashing Pumpkins was basically a psych band. You have the droning bass with the flitting, reverberating licks. My dad always told me not to turn up the volume there, and uh, hi dad, I know you listen to these, I'm advising all of my viewers of the same thing. Then comes the moment this whole record has been leading up to. Bang bang, you're dead. Hole in your head. That's the psych freak out of the psych freak out gods. Any and all restraint the pumpkins had has fallen away. Billy's screaming, guitars are wailing, Jimmy never had any restraint to begin with, but he's somehow in the negatives right now. Hearing this song as a preteen permanently rewired my brain. I uh, being exposed to this? You can't undo that. My dad also told me this song was the best song on Siamese Dream. While I favor Soma, dad makes a serious point. While most consider Melancholy to be the pumpkin's monium opus, fuck you, I use the Latin pronunciation, I think Siamese Dream is the ticket. It's more concise, the lows are not as low, the highs are just as high. Siamese Dream was my gateway drug. It was my first favorite album, and it dictated every single record I would love after. This is some challenging sh** for an 11 year old. But this album inspired me to seek out other challenging records, to always be broadening my horizons. I was primed to appreciate heavier records overall, uh, groups that weren't afraid to crank up the volume. I was primed to appreciate the sound of the 60s and 70s, analog recording, ridiculous drumming, Mellotron, and I learned to appreciate the art of the double album before I even knew what a double album was. It led me into goth territory. I loved The Cure in high school, and hell, Siamese Dream might even be the reason I love shoegaze. Uh, 30 years down the line, I think it's safe to say that this record was worth all the blood, all the sweat, every tear and every fucking penny they put into it. It's a feat of modern music production, and if the lens through which I see the world had a sound, it would be Siamese Dream. My personal favorites off this one are Cherub Rock, Hummer, Soma, Geek USA, Space Boy, and Silver Fuck. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays ever, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that is it. That is Smashing Pumpkin Siamese Dream. You know, it's amazing to me now that I ever worried about coming up with things to say about Siamese Dream. This video practically wrote itself. But what do you think? of Siamese Dream. Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums I love. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11 and... You are gonna wanna stick around for next week. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys then. Bye.